very hard to build up social cohesion and social trust. It's very hard to socially engineer that. Right? There aren't that many options or any effective government options to build up social trust, except perhaps to reduce immigration. social trust is going to fight much harder for each other, is going to be willing to sacrifice much more for each other. And governments try a bunch of things to increase social trust. It's one of the most uh, studied topics by academics that have a, trying to have an effect on public policy. So the government academic, the dominant academic approach to building social trust is the got to reduce the economic inequality, so you know, more social welfare spending. So that's we will build up the, the uh, social trust. But it really boils down to intangibles. Social trust is primarily a cognitive thing. Right? It primarily exists in people's minds. And so Generally speaking, you'll find that uh, more intelligent people are more trusting when they have reason to, to do so. So less intelligent people, they sense that they're less intelligent, that others are smarter than them, therefore they tend to be highly distrusting because they think everyone else is out to rip them off. But obviously it's easier for smart people to navigate life than dumb people. So, one thing you could do to build social trust is to enact policies that would encourage intelligent people to have more children and to discourage unintelligent people from having children. But that would be called eugenics. That's, that's a very, very bad thing. That is probably the one government policy that would have a significant effect on social trust. Intelligent people are much more likely to seek win-win solutions. Intelligent people tend to be more trusting, when appropriately so. But if you rip them off, then you know, they will be much more effective in wreaking revenge on you. Off the street and get right into the rainforest here. And then bucket heads. So uh, you'd think that perhaps urban societies would be more trusting if, if there's like a long history of people living very closely packed together, such as in Japan and China and Korea. Perhaps that might produce social trust, but does in Northeast Asia, but doesn't tend to around the rest of the world. So you think also a more uniform society is by definition, right, more cohesive. So a less individualist society, I think maybe there'd be more social trust, but Australia, New Zealand, and the United States prior to the 1960s were quite individualist compared to Japan, China, and Korea, yet they still had high social trust. So a corporate culture does not necessarily create social trust, but perhaps it reflects social trust. 
such as in uh, Northeast Asia. So one thing that exemplifies the cohesiveness of Australia is that in December everyone says Merry Christmas. Right? So they, they unite around this common holiday, Merry Chrissy. So haven't heard anyone say happy holidays instead of Merry Chrissy. That makes for a more cohesive society. So Australia is very secular compared to the United States. But still they all unite around Christmas. Japan, China, these are not uh, monotheist societies, yet they have comparatively high levels of social trust compared to many quote-unquote Christian nations. So Japan's a good example of a country that's pretty good without God. Right? They have very low rates of crime, very high rates of social trust and social cohesion, and very low rates of belief in monotheism, belief in God. Christianity or Judaism or Islam. So can people be good without God? Well, look at Japan. They have a morality that would put all Christian nations to shame. Like they're more law-abiding than Jewish Israel. So I'm back in Sydney and it feels great. I'm back in the big smoke. And uh, one of the great things about being in uh, Australia is that it's perfectly acceptable for a 55 year old man to walk around without his shirt on. Perfectly socially acceptable. So I was just down at the beach, just went to Clovelly, went to see Bluey. Do you know who Bluey is? Bluey's the groper. So I was down there at Clavelli, saw Bluey. As I was coming out of the water, this, this bloke said to me, Oh, have you seen Bluey? And then, oh, yeah, 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 he's out there. Got to see Bluey and just walked, walked to the beach, just totally topless. And it's socially acceptable, 55-year-old blokes. It's, it's A-OK -okay for you to walk to the beach, uh, you know, walk around town, totally topless. A-OK. -okay. So I saw two Aussies almost collide into each other. And I think this is, this you know, shows the difference between a high trust society and a low trust society. So these two Aussies almost collided with each other. As I, I, you know, one was walking this way, the other was turning around the corner. So the first Aussie said, oh, whoops, sorry about that. And the second Aussie said, that's all right. And that's how those sort of interactions go in Australia by and large. So I've been in Australia for seven weeks now. I haven't heard an angry word. I haven't seen like a nasty confrontation. I mean, Aussies love their punch up. So you, you go to the right pub, you know, you can get into a punch up. But by and large, like the, the leading Aussie sayings, they kind of reflect Aussie character. So that's all right. I, I've heard that saying over and over and over again, because I've been rocking up to homes over the past seven weeks and like staying there overnight. And it's like, Oh, you know, sorry to be an inconvenience and to be a bother. And, and the typical Aussie response you get is, that's all right. So that's a really common Aussie response. Like someone gets inconvenienced, you, you do something wrong, you, you step on someone's toes, you forget something. Like, that's all right. Really common Aussie response. Then another common Aussie response is, she'll be right, mate. No worries, mate. Fair dinkum. Rightio. Rightio. That means right. Got it. Right. It's all about homeostasis, right? Australia is a great place for homeostasis because everything is like kind of restoring you to homeostasis. Now, what homeostasis means, a, a solid state, right? It's a, homeostasis is a self-regulating process by which biological systems maintain stability while adjusting to changing external conditions, right? It's a central organizing tenet of physiology. So homeostasis, like, that's where we want to be. 
we don't want to be depending upon like having sex with our spouse to, you know, even us out. We don't want to depend upon our spouse to, you know, buck us up with lots of praise and affirmation. We don't want to have to, you know, depend upon our big sister, you know, for common sense and how to navigate reality. All right. You don't want to, you know, depend upon your boss's praise so that you feel a okay. All right. We don't want to be unnecessarily dependent upon others. There's like a proper level of dependence, but we don't want to be, we don't want, we don't want to be knocked off our equilibrium. And it just seems like Aussie life is all about restoring homeostasis. She'll be right, mate. No worries, mate. No worries, mate. Right? Uh, rightio. All right. Fair dinkum. So I was just been watching this uh, Australian TV series called The Tourist. It's about some Aussie, no, about some Irishman who gets into a car crash in outback Australia and suffers complete amnesia, just completely forgets who he is, he forgets his his name, just forgets everything, fair dinkum. And, and uh, part of the plot, there are these two Italian mafia guys who come to wipe him out, and they get picked up by an Aussie tax, taxi rider, taxi driver, and the taxi driver is like, fair dinkum Aussie, like, oh, she'll be right, mate, no worries, mate, right, yo. And these uptight, tense, you know, Italian hitmen they don't they don't really cotton well to this Aussie attitude of she'll be right, mate, no worries, mate, fair dinkum. Right, yeah. That's all right. So it's kind of fun to, to watch this Aussie TV show and then see these, you know, caricatures of of uh, other nations uh coming coming to Australia to carry out this hit. Oh. So uh just came from about three and a half weeks in Tanham Sands. And I got my first check from the Tanham Garden Center for my hard work, which I put here on, on YouTube so you could, you could see how hard I was working. Like some days I'd be shifting like three tons of cement. All right. So I got my first check, like money in the bank. I've got my Australian Medicare card so I can go out there, get all the health care I want basically for free. I can go out and get hundreds of dollars worth of blood tests. Right. No cost to me. I got my Australian tax ID number, so I'm working here legally, all right? Totally on the books, legal, all right? Fair dinkum. I got my Australian passport, all right? I, I'm all ready to rock it as an Aussie. So I got, so Ten of Sands had basically no recorded COVID taste, cases, as far as I'm aware, until like this week. Now there are like dozens of cases in, in Ten of Sands. So uh, Queensland had locked off the border so states led the responses to COVID in Australia. So the state of Queensland basically blocked off the border, basically made it virtually impossible to travel into Queensland. And so as a result, when I got here, there'd be like five cases, new cases of COVID a day in Queensland. Well, today there's something like 11, 12,000 new cases of COVID, overwhelmingly Omicron in Queensland. So you can see why why uh, you know, the various states would, would you know, lock everyone out. So West Australia still got everyone locked out until February. And so they're only reporting like two, three, four, five new cases a day. But South Australia is reporting about 5,000 new cases a day. Victoria, about 15,000. New South Wales, close to 40,000 new cases of uh, Omicron uh, COVID a day. Uh, not that many hospitalizations, not that many people dying, but... Uh, but uh, Tenham Sands, man, went from basically zero cases of COVID to this week, dozens of cases. Like people are lining up at the doctor's office to get their booster shots. So the time it takes till you're recommended to get your booster shot has dropped from like six to five to, to, I think it's about four months now. So what are some of the other top uh, Australian sayings? Wrap your laughing gear around that. Dog's breakfast. Tell him he's dreaming. So... In America, when you go see someone, you call first. But in Australia, if it's a mate, you just show up, and your mate will greet, grant you, you know, greet you with a stubby, right, a beer, four X or a Foster's Lager, or depending on the time of the day or the season, like a, you know, hot cuppa of tea or coffee, maybe some bickies. All right, you just rock up to your mate's house. All right, Australian slang: thirty-three phrases to help you talk like an Aussie. Fair go, mate. Fair suck of the sauce bottle. Fair crack of the whip. Okay, this was made famous by the ill-fated former Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd. He speaks Chinese, really smart guy, not such a great politician. 
He enjoyed using Australian slang to speak to the electorate and pleaded for a fair suck. So do you, do you feel like you need a fair suck? That means you want to be treated fairly. So fair suck was coined by struggling Aussie families who shared droppings of tomato sauce to flavor their meat. Such was the hard life that all they wanted was an equitable suck. In the fields, they needed a fair crack of the whip. Fair go, mate. Right. No worries, mate. She'll be right. Right. This reflects a national stoicism that everything will turn out fine in the end. So that being the case, there's no reason to worry about anything. Have a Captain Cook. That means to have a look. It's a brief inspection. So I was at various places in, on the eastern seaboard of Australia where Captain Cook was back in 1770 when he was like one of the first Europeans to, to navigate Australia and to name places in Australia. So Captain Cook was the first Brit to map eastern Australia. Captain James Cook, he skippered the HMB Endeavour. And after landing at Botany Bay, he sailed on past Sydney Harbour. He had a Captain Cook, a look, and he liked it. Okay, what's the John Dory? So John Dory is a fish found in the Sydney Harbour. It's great grilled with lemon and pepper. Also, it rhymes with story. So when people want to know what's going on, they're requesting the goss, the gossip. They ask, what, what a John Dory, what the John Dory is. Okay, 29. A few stubbies short of a six-pack, a few sandwiches short of a picnic. All right, so a six-pack... In American terms, means anyone with fit abdomens. But it used to be, you know, in Australian speak, six-pack means beers. So if someone's a bit slow, you know, if someone's feeling under the weather, all right, they're feeling a few stubbies short of a six-pack. They're not the full quid, all right? For those who don't speak about money or alcohol, they'll say a few sandwiches short of a picnic. Tell him he's dreaming. So this was given airtime in the movie The Castle. That's when you advise someone involved in business transaction to tell their counterpart that he's dreaming. You're suggesting that the other side's not offering a fair deal. Dog's breakfast, right? It's messy. It doesn't refer to food. It uh, is often used by parents to refer to their kids' chaotic lives. No water, just shambles, no thought, just a bit of everything, just a dog's breakfast. Wrap your laughing gear around that. Okay, while well, some suggest you can laugh on the inside, your main laughing gear is your mouth. So when you wrap your laughing gear around it, that means you're eating it. A rip snorter. Right? Someone playing a good game of sport, having a blinder, right? That's something that's exceptionally good. So a rip snorter or a bonza or a butte. So I've been having a butte time in Aussie. 24. Better than a ham sandwich, better than a kick up the backside. It's right? something that is better than nothing. Even if you were paid peanuts, right? It's better than a kick up the backside. You'd prefer a fair whack. But things are better than a ham sandwich. Buckley's chance. So William Buckley was Australia's very own Robinson Crusoe. He's a man who escaped a convict ship during the first attempt to settle Melbourne in 1803. Three decades later, colonials returned to find a tattooed, two-meter-tall, long-bearded man with half-Aboriginal children who spoke tribal tongue and picked up English within days. So they soon realized it was Buckley who was given a pardon, and he was used as a peacemaker between whites and black. So... In, in LA, if you accidentally bump into the wrong type of person, like they, they're looking to start a fight, right? They're like perpetually aggrieved groups in, in America, just you know, always looking for violence to, to start a fight, confrontation, like always you know, looking to read every interaction in the worst possible light. So we have a little bit of Black Lives Matter here, but it's about, I don't know, it's about 5% as strong as the movement is in America. So there's a, you know, a little bit of concern about the popo, the police here, but overall, it's very, very weak. Now, I haven't seen any Black Lives Matter anti-police agitation. You know, like, in Australia, you can walk onto people's property and they don't shoot you. Like, if you're thirsty, you can walk onto someone's property and, like, open up the hose and have a drink. Right? That's perfectly acceptable. Like, we would just transgress over people's property all the time when I was growing up. It's, it's not a big deal. Okay, so Buckley advocated cooperation with the Aboriginals. But after the 1840s decade of slaughtering Aboriginals, right, it was said that uh, he had a Buckley's chance of making peace. So Buckley's chance means very little chance. So he spent the last part of his life as a poor loner in Tasmania. There was a lobby to give him a government pension, but once again he had Buckley's chance, right? Means no chance at all. Pull the wool over your eyes. All right, this derives from the bush. All right, the history of earning a buck around wool sheds meant people had to give an honest day's work. 
right? Australians had to be genuine with each other so they could all get their fair share of the spuds, meaning potatoes. So if someone's being a little sheepy, dishonest, or spinning a yarn, they're trying to pull the wool over your eyes. All right, dog's eye. Okay, so what really goes on inside the Aussie staple a meat pie? Is it beef? Is it kangaroo? The important thing is that it rhymes. So when you're having a pie, it's looking back at you in a canine kind of way. It's a dog's eye. Could that really be the runny meat feeling? The dog's eye, that's when the, the meat pie is looking back at you. Bastards. All right, that's anyone who doesn't play fair. So remember Breaker Morant when he was getting shot? by that English firing squad, he famously shouted his last word, shoot straight, you bastards. So during the infamous 1932-33 Bodyline cricket series, the English captain, Douglas Jardine, so Bodyline meant they pitched the, the cricket ball to hit people. He walked into the Australian dressing room to complain about being called a bastard. An Australian cricketer supposedly asked him, which one of you bastards called this bastard a bastard? So uh, bastard is not necessarily a negative term. In Australia, everyone's a bastard. Toads, banana benders, cockies, sand gropers, crow eaters. Right? These are favorite Aussie ways to disparage those who live elsewhere. So tropical Queensland has many more bananas and cane toads than people, so they're branded banana benders or cane toads. Queenslanders get their own back. They call Sydney ciders cockroaches in honor of the omnipresent nuclear immune pest found around Sydney. South Australians eat crow. So Western Australians spend their lives groping sand, so they're sand gropers. And the South, South Australians crow eaters. Ocker or Yabo, that's the loud mouth, there's a larrikin, you know, Shane Warne, all right? There's a new documentary, it's going to be on Amazon Prime about the great Australian spin bowler, Shane Warne, the greatest spin bowler of all time, all right? He's a larrikin, he's a Yabo, someone who likes the sound of his own voice, bit of a troublemaker. So a Yabo typically has a deep Australian twang to his accent, in which case he's also got, he's got an ochre. Ochre is a deep Australian accent. Put a sock in it means to shut up. Throw a shrimp on the barbie. Okay, it's a way of inviting someone to your house for lunch, where you throw a shrimp or a sausage on the barbie. Do the Harry. So Harry Holt was a Prime Minister of Australia who disappeared off Victoria's coast in 1967. He went for a swim and he was never found again. So he did the bolt from responsibilities of Prime Ministership. So some say he was abducted by UFOs or by a Chinese submarine. Most likely he was caught in deadly currents. He was washed out to sea. His body was never found. So anyone doing a disappearing act, say they're doing a Harold Holt. So when you have to mosey on or get the hell out of here, you do the Bolt, aka the Harold Holt, or simply you do the Harry. Six of one, half a dozen of the other. It's not quite you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. It's not quite caught between the devil and the deep blue sea. It's when it's 50-50 odds but whatever decision you make likely will not affect the outcome of the situation. Not pissing on someone when they're on fire. I think Americans know what that means. It means you don't care about somebody. Crikey or blimey are euphemisms to communicate amazement or surprise. Oi for drongos and galas. So chanted three times after Aussie, 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 oi, oi, oi. Right? That's our national cry. Normal use its mouth when you disagree with what someone is doing or to convey annoyance or to get someone's attention, such as when someone's being a drongo or a gala, right? Someone who has rocks in their heads. Oi, oi, oi. That means you don't like what someone's doing. Oi, oi, oi. Blokes and sheilas, right? So when Julia Gillard was voted in as the country's first female prime minister, it didn't take long for Australia to start calling this prime minister's partner the first bloke, right? Sheilas are, are women. Bushman's handkerchief, that means using your hands to delicately, delicately drain the snot from your nose, right? That's a Bushman's handkerchief. On your bike, tell your story walking. When you don't want to have anything to do with someone, you tell him to get on your bike, right? Which suggests that he leaves. It's kind of the opposite of hold your horses, which requests someone to stay or begs their patience or similar, keep your pants on or don't get your knickers in a knot. When you tell someone to get on your bike, you're telling them to tell their story when they're walking away from you. Lobster, pineapple, grey nurse. Australians don't barter with lobsters and pineapples, but most have had at least one friend ring them up to lend lobster or pineapple. So a $20 note is a sparkling red lobster. The $50 note is bright yellow, so it's pineapple, right? So lobster, 20 bucks. $50 is pineapple. $100 blue-grey is a grey nurse. 
And the five and ten dollar notes are referred to by Pam Shriver as a fiver, and Aton Senner is a tenner. Smoko, a garbo, a bolo, a botlo, and an avo. That's the ten minute work break after two hours of work. So O is the suffix to any word that it can shorten. So if in doubt, throw an O onto the end of a word and it's about to be Australian, bound to be Australian. So a break when you sm smoke or you don't even have to smoke to take a smoke. I took a lot of smokers at the town of guns. Someone who collects garbage is a garbo. A bowling and community club is a bolo. A bottle shop is a bottle -o. And the word afternoon is an avo. Right? Hope you're having a good avo. Have a go, you mug. That's the favorite call from people who are watching sports from budget seating. Right, that's, you hear it at cricket when the batsman is blocking the ball too much and not whacking it around the ground. Or at football games where the team isn't being inventive enough in trying to score. So it refers to anyone who isn't pulling, putting in full effort, or taking any risk. Have a go, you mug. Cooey. Right, that's a loud Aboriginal cry in the outback that tells people where you are. So if you're not within a cooey of someone, you know where bloody near it, all right? Gone walkabout. Right, it's from the natives. They enjoy going walkabout. So Australians enjoy traveling, whether it's backpacking around Asia or following a harvest at home. And go on, walk about. One for the road. That's the last drink before going home. And hit the frog and toad. Right? Having a frog in your throat means you've got a sore throat. But hitting the frog and toad is when you hit the road. All right? When you just get out of here. So in Australia, seven weeks, haven't heard a crossword. Haven't seen a punch up. Haven't seen any aggro. It's just homeostasis, mate. Just homeostasis. And I went and saw Bluey this afternoon, the, the blue groiper at the Clavelli Beach. Uh, it was beaut, mate. Absolutely beaut. No worries. I'm going on a walkabout. Pretty here. So it's uh, January 7th where I am in Sydney, Australia. But it's uh, January 6th in the United States. And so. Most of my news subscriptions are to American sources like the LA Times, New York Times, Washington Post, and all these sources are preoccupied with, with the question of uh, did or how much did the January 6 riots on Capitol Hill threaten our democracy? And apparently it's just the conventional wisdom by a ruling class that these January 6 Capitol Hill riots like deeply, deeply threatened our, our democracy. And I think that's nonsense. All right. <laughs> okay. Cut, cut it out. So, as opposed to almost everyone in my chat room, I think the January 6 riots were a horrible thing. All right? We're, we're an absolute disaster. So, so compared, to, compared to people who, who watch me or, or read me, I am far harsher on the January 6th riots. I want all the January 6th, I didn't think it was uh, particularly funny, even at the time. I think it was, it was a disaster. I'm a law and order type, type of guy, right? So I want rioters, whether they're on the left or the right, who destroy public property and who disrupt uh, public events. I want them to all to be prosecuted, whether they're on the right or the left. So I want. Black Lives Matter rioters who committed criminal acts prosecuted. I want Antifa rioters committed public uh, disorder and, and broke the law. I want them prosecuted. I want the January 6th rioters prosecuted. I want uh, you know, any, any group that is causing you know, massive disruption through illegal means and destroying public property, I want them all prosecuted. All right? So I want, the, I want the January 6th rioters prosecuted as much as I want the Black Lives Matter rioters prosecuted. So I've never been in favor of the January 6th riots. Right? I've always thought they were a disaster. But they didn't threaten democracy. Right? Why would the January 6th riots threaten democracy uh, any more than all those disruptions in Wisconsin when Scott Walker was governor and left-wing and union agitators occupied the state capitol and try to make it as difficult as possible to do the business of government. So I, I do think that there are probably a lot of things that, that threaten democracy. To me, uh, the, the threat posed by the January 6th Capitol Hill riots to our democracy is infinitesimal because the problem got dealt with in a few hours and everyone 
who played a role in it is going to pay a, a big price. So the, the January 6th Capitol rioters are all getting prosecuted. So I'm not, I'm not concerned about that. I just don't see how that threatens our democracy because the people who did it have been dealt with and precedents have been set and people who are in favor of that in the public space, they, they dealt with enormous repercussions. So I do think you can argue there are a lot of things that threaten our democracy, such as the dramatic decline in social trust and social cohesion. Right? There's been a dramatic decline in social trust and social cohesion in the United States and in the United Kingdom over the past 60 years. That is huge because that is very, very, very difficult to rebuild. So I'm walking around Sydney and I'm not seeing any of the examples of social decohesion and distrust that I see on an epidemic level in, in Los Angeles. So in Sydney, if someone accidentally bumps into you, it's not a cause for a beatdown, generally speaking. But in, in Los Angeles, there are certain groups who are just you know, eager to go to war, eager to fight, and you, you make one step wrong and uh, you're going to get beat. Like, there's no polar bear hunting in Sydney, as far as I'm aware. Right? White people are not getting, you know, hunted down by roving packs of views to just get a beat down. Right? To me, that's a major threat to our democracy, that we no longer share the same moral universe as our fellow citizens, right? We no longer share a sense of what's right and wrong. That is a threat to our democracy. That the conservative or the right-wing perspective on all sorts of issues is not allowed to be shared on social media, such as Facebook or, or Twitter. You're not allowed to share, for example, the conservative opinion on transsexuals, right? I, I'm not sure I'm, I'm even allowed to say what that right-wing opinion is, but uh, let's just say it's not super positive. Right. You're not even allowed to share that on, on Facebook and Twitter and, and YouTube. So I think you can make a good case that that threatens democracy, that one political point of view is not allowed to be shared on, on social media. But it's the decline in social trust and social cohesion. And people who study social trust and social cohesion see that it's generally in opposition to diversity. Right? Generally speaking, the more diversity, the less people trust each other. Now, uh, th that's just a very broad view. So there are certain types of diversity that don't dramatically decrease social trust, but there are other types of diversity that do dramatically decrease social trust. So crime, right? crime destroys social trust. So particularly like a good Samaritan who stops to help someone who's broken down by the side of the road and then is murdered, right? That <laughs> that sort of thing just kills social trust. So I think our enormous crime rates in the United States are far more of a threat to our democracy than the January 6th rioters. And then Black Lives Matter, right? They had riots for weeks, disrupting the lives of millions and millions of people. And Black Lives Matter rioters and Antifa rioters, generally speaking, haven't been punished for their law-breaking activity. So in the United States, we increasingly have these protected groups. So depending on the context, in some contexts it's blacks, in some contexts it's, it's gays, in some contexts it's, it's Jews or, or Muslims or transsexuals or homosexuals, right? Depending on the context, we have certain protected groups who you're not allowed to publicly criticize. And to me, that's an enormous threat to our social cohesion and our social trust because we, we have destroyed the level playing field. I am so dramatically improved by accurate criticism. Right? Every group, every individual is improved by accurate criticism. And the idea that certain groups and certain individuals, because they've got a quote-unquote protected status, cannot be criticized, that that somehow is good for society or, or even good for those protected groups is absurd. So the designation of protected groups that you can't criticize and that you have to take, you know, employ different rules for, that, I think, destroys democracy. There are no employers who don't want to employ certain protected groups because it's so difficult to then fire them. Uh, we no longer have as much freedom of association and, and freedom of speech that we used to have. We, we've replaced, as Christopher Cordwell points out, the original constitution with the civil rights constitution. So now you have to employ, you have to rent to, you have to you know, accommodate all sorts of groups, even if 
that's not your individual preference. So the, this destruction of social coherence and social trust by saying, oh, you can't discriminate in who you rent to or you can't discriminate in who you employ means that employers and landlords can no longer have as much trust with their employees and their renters, right? That seems to me that's a destruction of social trust, social coherence, and is a major threat to American democracy. If it weren't for the summer of love, the honoring of St. Joy, St. George Floyd, my view of January 6th would probably be way closer to the left's framing. Hmm. Well, it's, I don't think it's terribly complicated. Most people on the right are for law and order, right? If you, if you truly support law and order, you don't just support it when it's employed against your political enemies, right? You have to support law and order, I would think, across the board. What's up with Baked Alaska? Is he in legal jeopardy? Yeah, I think he's in legal jeopardy. So the, the increasing uh, rights that are extended to, to transsexuals and how disruptive that can be in, in the public space, right? I think that is, is an example of, of uh, destruction of social trust and, and social coherence. Right? It's very, very hard to change people. Right? This is Edward Banfield writing in 1958. There is no evidence that the ethos of a people can be changed according to plan. Right? This goes for the dramatic civil rights changes with regard to different races, with regard to women, with regard to homosexuals and to transsexuals. This, this trying to dramatically change an ethos of a people, that doesn't work and it destroys social coherence and social trust. Is one thing to engineer consent by the techniques of mass manipulation, which don't work anyway. Right? To change a people's fundamental view of the world is a different thing, especially if the change is in the direction of a more complicated and demanding morality. And that's what we have now with the, the you know, ever more intrusive implications of the civil rights revolution, you know, designating more and more groups as protected and therefore must be accorded special privileges. I, I, I would think that destroy social trust and with it uh, democracy right that we can no longer discipline kids in school because certain groups were disciplined more than other groups why would we expect all groups in school to be disciplined equally right so just look at kids all right I, i'm a convert to judaism and let me just say that uh, jewish infants jewish children are far more rambunctious than the children of uh, northern europeans that i grew up around all right. And Japanese children are even more restrained on better behavior than children of Northern Europeans. So definitely some groups are more extroverted than other groups. Some groups are more lively than other groups. Some groups have more testosterone than other groups. Some groups are more uh, physically confrontational than other groups. So why on earth would you expect that crime rates would be equal among all groups, that uh, school discipline would be equal among all groups? Obviously, uh, boys, you would expect to be more lively, all right? What, one of the fundamental differences between men and women is that uh, men tend to be much more physically confrontational. All right? Men are much more likely to resort to violence. So a man is about 10 times more likely to, to murder you than a woman. So there are obvious differences between the sexes and there are differences between different groups. Uh, much of it comes down to testosterone levels uh, much of it comes down to, say, qualities of extroversion, and uh, much of it comes down to how much are you willing to sacrifice today for a future reward, All right? So because discipline, school discipline, because uh, law enforcement discipline results in unequal arrest levels between groups, uh, therefore we're now trashing law enforcement and trashing school discipline, that seems to me to be a major threat to democracy. Look, you remember the name of that left-wing girl you interviewed who turned out to be pretending to be black. Uh, it'll, it'll come to me. Yeah. She was uh, transgender and also transracial. So to laugh at someone who's transgender, that's, that's off the board, right? You, you can't do that. But we are currently allowed to race it, or laugh at people who, who try to be transracial. So why do so many people try to be transracial? 
because we've set up a society in America where affirmative action is accepted and so people get all sorts of privileges based on, on the color of their skin, based on their race. That seems to me that's a, a threat to democracy. Right? That seems, affirmative action seems to be much more of a threat to democracy than the January 6 riots. How could, how could uh, citizens feel at ease with that knowing that certain groups were favored, would receive preferences in, in hiring or in getting government contracts? Right? How is that going to solidify social trust, social cohesion, and, and democracy? Right? Also, so many questions have been taken outside of the realm of democracy. Right? So we had the Black Lives Matter riots running wild in the USA. Most people didn't approve of that, but there was very little crackdown because Black Lives Matter, this terrorist group, was considered you know, protected. Right? And so you had all these Fortune 500 companies pouring in money into this terrorist movement, Black Lives Matter. And this group and its, its uh, riots would just run wild, causing you know, billions and billions of dollars of property damage, disrupting tens of millions of lives, making millions of people feel unsafe, you know, dramatically, dramatically increasing crime levels, particularly murder levels. Since, since George Floyd was arrested, like overall murder levels in the U.S. have dropped about 20%, when normally... Normally, you would expect uh, murder levels to drop about 3% a year because of improvements in technology. So I'm walking around Sydney and I see increasingly you know, so many things are under surveillance that there's you know, live camera footage in public sp spaces. You would expect that would significantly reduce murder rates and other crime rates. Instead, we're having a dramatic murder surge and a dramatic uh, surge in other types of crime. Also, because we have provided all these incentives for the police not to do their jobs, we have a dramatic increase in traffic deaths, in driving deaths, and in pedestrian deaths. Because when you don't allow discipline, people behave in a less disciplined fashion. And certain groups um, are much more rambunctious than, than other groups. Right? The, the, there's the cliche about Asian drivers, that they drive very slowly and carefully. You, you think, to the extent that that... Uh, that cliche is true. You think that only applies to, to driving? No, it also applies to the way people conduct themselves sexually, the way people conduct themselves in business. All right, some groups are much more circumspect than other groups. Some groups are much more careful than other groups. Right? Some groups take uh, conception and sexuality much more seriously than, than other groups. So I'm just reading an essay on a website, I'm1776.com, and here's a great line from it. It is not that a critical mass of Americans was persuaded to support abortion, gay marriage, or Black Lives Matter. These were victories delivered by judicial fiat or mass intimidation. You don't think that threatens democracy? That all sorts of hot-button controversial issues have been removed from public discussion? That only one side can be presented in social media? And that these issues have been removed from the vote? That essentially we have mass intimidation or judicial fiat deciding all sorts of hot-button issues that Americans are incredibly divided over. You don't think that threatens democracy? Right? You've got Antifa and Black Lives Matter riots running wild in America with very little pushback. Right? The tens of millions of Americans had their lives disrupted, and there was no payback for, for those groups. You don't think that threatens democracy, that you see certain groups can behave in a criminal manner. You can have certain terrorist groups like Antifa and Black Lives Matter and they get massive funding, right? They get massive support, and they're essentially immune from law enforcement prosecution. Let me, let me not exaggerate that. Compared to, say, if these were Trump voters, right, they receive much less uh, law enforcement uh, discipline and, and arrests and, and prosecution. So the, the people who disrupted the Donald Trump inauguration in 2016, virtually none of them face any prosecution because the, the prosecutors in Washington, D.C. just decided to let them off the hook because they were on the left protesting Donald Trump. So we have George Soros wielding his power very effectively. And uh, people who think like George Soros, they've managed to elect all sorts of DAs who are not really interested in enforcing the law. And so that's part of the reason we have this massive crime wave because of George Soros supported DAs in Los Angeles and San Francisco and Philadelphia throughout the U.S., the left playing that part of the political game much more effectively than the right, 
Like, what, why doesn't the right pay attention to district attorney races? But we have these district attorneys in Los Angeles and San Francisco who are not interested in enforcing uh, many types of law. And so we have uh, threat, theft running wild, we have murder rates skyrocketing, we have millions of Americans feel increasingly unsafe and under threat because we have politically and racially motivated law enforcement that doesn't want to prosecute certain crimes because certain groups commit a disproportionate number of the crimes and so, you know, we send enough quote-unquote young black men to prison or, you know, whatever the, the protected group de jour is of, of the day. So, yeah, the name of the left-wing girl I interviewed who turned out to be pretending to be black, uh, non-colloquial. And turned out to be a well-off Italian chick. Abortion laws were settled by elected officials in Norway. So no other country has the social division and culture war over abortion that the United States has. And in, in part, that's because abortion law was taken away from elected officials in the United States and was essentially decided by judicial fiat. So you don't think that threatens our democracy? Right. Most Americans, I would suspect, would prefer a different immigration policy over the last 60 years. So wages for construction workers, uh, wages for people who didn't graduate high school have essentially stayed flat since about 1960 because we've had massive amounts of immigration. Right? We get to decide our wage levels by how much immigration we allow. So the United States has allowed a massive immigration that has destroyed wages for quote-unquote unskilled workers. And it's also damaged, damaged uh, wages as you keep you know, moving up in the degree of skills because the United States has not been interested in enforcing immigration law. The United States has not been interested in protecting its borders. That's massively distorted our economy and distorted the ability of, of you know, ordinary Americans to make a living, to get married, and to have children. All right, you don't think that threatens our democracy? That uh, the people have not been really given a choice that uh, essentially both Republicans and Democrats have taken immigration off the table. And uh, so people who haven't had an opportunity really to vote for immigration enforcement, you don't think that, that threatens democracy? Like we have all these laws on the books that are not enforced, such as immigration and, and laws against theft and uh, laws against you know, criminal, criminal rioting. I mean... It seems that uh, not enforcing our immigration laws, allowing Black Lives Matter and Antifa to, to run wild, I'd see that as threatening democracy. And it's not diversity in and of itself necessarily that, that threatens democracy. Some types of diversity threaten social trust and cohesion more than others. All right, so de declaring certain groups as protected Right, that is always going to you know, destroy social trust. If, if we're not on a, operating on a living level playing field, then uh, people are going to you know, increasingly disengage from public life and have increasing distrust of their fellow citizens, which is exactly what we have seen over the past 60 years. So, so diversity and social trust, uh, the, the, they do generally seem to be in tension, but we can't forget that there are certain components that affect th this social trust and social cohesion much more than others. So it's not, it's not inherently like the percentage of blacks or the percentage of Jews or the percentage of Muslims that's going to destroy social cohesion or, or, or social trust. It's, you know, what are, the, what are the incentives that are operating in the society? So in the United States, prior to the 1960s, minority groups were heavily incentivized to never <clears throat> speak publicly or to be seen acting publicly in ways that were to the detriment of the majority. All right? But since the rise of multiculturalism and uh, the celebration of ethnic diversity in the 1960s, now it's increasingly cool for, for different racial religious groups to proclaim that they're putting the interests of their group ahead of the general welfare. All right? That is going to negatively affect democracy. All right? That's going to negatively affect 
social cohesion and, and social trust. So you had a, an explosion of yeshivas, all right, in during World War II and the Vietnam War, so the Jewish kids who didn't want to serve in the armed forces, who wanted to escape the draft, they would just sign up to train to become rabbis, all right? That sort of manipulating the system, that destroys social trust and, and social cohesion. And uh, it's not just, you know, it's not just Jews, it's not just Muslims, it's not just blacks, it's not just, you know, homosexuals. It's, it's what are the incentives that are operating, all right? So when you extend more freedom, right, sometimes you extend more freedom to individuals and to groups, and they abuse that freedom, right? They... You know, their crime rate massively increases, their social destruction rate massively increases, you know, their use of drugs and alcohol massively increases. So, for example, after the civil rights revolution in the mid-1960s, the, the crime rate just shot up. So you think, oh, we're finally extending civil rights to, to African Americans. You know, now that's going to create a calming effect. But no, it created an explosion in crime. You had the Watts riots. You had riots in Detroit. You had all these, you know, murder-filled, massively destructive riots after the civil rights legislation. So you extend liberty and civil rights, and then certain members of the the group that is getting those civil liberties and rights, you know, a segment of that group, then massively misbehaves in a way that they probably would not have if they hadn't been extended that extra that extra privilege, the, those those new rights. Uh, that, that new protected status. So I've been uh, rereading Middlemarch, and I think uh, uh, Dorothea Brooke tells Mr. Kasorban that he's doing the right thing in subsidizing and paying for his, his uh, second cousin, Will Ladislaw, to you know, go to Europe to explore instead of settling down in a profession. And uh, I think Dorothea Brooke says something to the effect that, you know, you will give him freedom and then whether he abuses it or uses it profitably, that's up to him. You're just giving him the opportunity. So sometimes when you extend freedom to a group, extend more rights or protected status, they abuse it. Sometimes they don't abuse it, all right? It's not, it's not a universal reaction. Uh, think about the very restrictive way that China deals with Muslims and the very discriminatory way that India deals with, with Muslims. So... Uh, India and China have relatively very low rates of Muslim terrorism. So it's possible that if India and China started treating their Muslims better, that uh, prosperity would flourish and you know, peace and freedom would break out. On the other hand, extending you know, new rights and protections to minorities can result frequently in an explosion of violence, in an explosion of terror, in an explosion of dysfunctional behavior. All right, so... People on the conservatives love to scream, freedom! Ted Cruz, remember he did that rant, freedom! Well, sometimes some individuals and some groups use freedom profitably, but just as often individuals and groups use freedom destructively. Like for a lot of people and for a lot of groups, more freedom is the very opposite of what they need. After we had the massive extension of civil rights protections to homosexuals and the, the ending of laws against homosexual behavior, then you had the AIDS epidemic. You had an explosion of, of AIDS, which was primarily transmitted by unprotected anal sex, you know, between blokes, but between men. So you had an increase in rights and protections to, to homosexuals, and then a segment of the homosexual community, you know, then went wild. Hard to forget your first time when you take a shield to the beach. Alright, you're also the first time, first time you're introducing your family, first time you're introducing your friends, first time you make love, first time you go to synagogue together. What about the first time you go to the beach? Alright? A really vulnerable time. Alright, so you expect to end with your family, with your friends, with your 
community, but uh, what about what about the first time we go to the beach, right? Very vulnerable time. It's very exciting to see each other in all sorts of new situations. Smashing against the waves. Beach is the Australian Cathedral, right? This is the Aussie Church. So, uh, and women want to be out to come to the beach and not be harassed, right? That was the problem with the Canola riots. So women here they feel unsafe. Now, look at these rock formations. This is where the early Christians used to hide from the Romans. Prior to Constantine accepting Christianity, this is where the other Christians would hide out in these rocks. They hide here from the Roman hordes. But the first time you take it all to the beach, like you may think she looks good on a day, right? I remember I met this woman in church when I was 18, she looked really good. And she invited me over to her place that evening to watch a movie. I got over to her place. She was as rough as bags because she wasn't wearing the same makeup that she wore to church. So I remember I met a woman on a, a Friday night Jewish event. I invited her to a concert the next night. But I only saw her at the Jewish event under you know, very dark lighting. I'm trying to pick her up. She weighed over 20 pounds and the seatbelt in my van wouldn't fit around her. Or you take your woman to the beach for the first time and like it's vulnerable. Like she may not look good in, in a bathing suit or she may not deal well with the waves or she may get in the ocean and the tits fly out like right in front of your friends. And uh, it's embarrassing. You might be able to have a girlfriend who fits in with all areas of your life as much as possible. So one thing I've found, I'm 55 years of age, everybody's more vulnerable than you may initially think. Like we've all got so many vulnerabilities. So for some people that's the beach, for some people it's wearing a bathing suit. I don't know if you're allowed to fish here. I don't know. There's a lot of fishing going on. Why are, why are there no Chinese fishing? Good question, Nick. Good question. So, getting to know someone, man, it exposes your vulnerabilities, it exposes her vulnerabilities. All right. You know, the more you interact with people, you wanted to fit in with your friends, you wanted to fit in with your, your workmates, you wanted to fit in with your family, you wanted to fit in at the beach, right? Like, how could you have a girlfriend who didn't fit in at the beach? Right? That would suck. I love the beach. I always live at the beach. I had an American girlfriend who, we spent a weekend away at the beach, I think in Manhattan Beach, man, she was so impressed. When uh, I went running into the ocean, just dive through the waves, she said I looked like Adonis. I was 40 years of age then, mate. So, I think I learned to swim at about age five or six or seven, something like that. Not real early. Pretty much all Aussies know how to swim. We spend us you know, much of our spare time out at the beach. So I remember in the uh, Tom Wolfe novel, The Bonfire of the Vanities, as a district attorney, deputy district attorney, he likes up from the floor as his, at his wife. He just sees how enormous her behind is. And it uh, leads him to want to get a mistress. 
inside. Um, we all have angles by which we're vulnerable. That could be our emotional intelligence, our cognitive intelligence, our, our physique, our social skills, and lack thereof. And there's always an angle where we look ridiculous. There's always, there's always an angle where we look vulnerable. There's always an angle where we look stupid. There's always an angle where we look wrong. Well, it depends on the perspective you take. So, how do you deal with your anxiety? Right? How do you deal when you feel ill at ease in the world, when your life gets unmanageable? You go to the beach, you take a drink, you watch the telly, play video games, you pray and meditate, you practice yoga. So I've been watching these, uh, this, this documentary series on the ashes, the you know, England versus Australia cricket rivalry. And back in the 1980s, the Aussie cricket team would just get smashed on plane flights. So, uh, various Aussie cricketers would drink 40, 50, 50 beers on you know, the 20 hour flight. So they don't do that so much anymore. Now they're more into prayer and meditation. Yeah, it's gorgeous, isn't it? And the Aussie shooters are so vulnerable, mate. Right? They're just like wearing bikinis down at the beach. They're so fit. And they can afford to be so vulnerable because it's safe, right? And uh, they don't have their, their guard up. You know, they're perfectly friendly. They don't bite, mate. They don't bite. Yeah, times were different in the 80s. That was a, like sex, drugs, and rock and roll time for Australian cricket. And I think we lost the Nasher series in the 1990s. We just thrashed England for a decade. Yeah, Brooke and Sham, I've got some recovery. Yeah. Why do some people stay in this trouble? For most of us, we don't have to stay in suffering. Right? So why do some people choose to stay in suffering? And we're coming up now on Bondi Beach. This is the world famous Bondi Beach, mate. This is Bondi Beach. That's what you're looking at, mate. That beautiful or what? Oh, no worries, mate. No worries. This is Bondi Beach. Why do some people choose to stay in misery? Right? This is a great spot for surfing. And last time I came up these stairs, I tripped and fell on a wild live stream. It's really hot shit. I said, You right, mate? spiritually centered, spiritually aligned. And for the first 44 years of my life, spirituality was like the last thing on my mind. Yeah, Luke needs a my pillow over that mic. So we used to despise spirituality, despise the concepts. It's only when the suffering got bad enough that I opened my mind. I can't believe that I'm holding the spiritual alignment. Both steps, and connecting to my power. 
up these days. So contrary to what I used to think about things. But when the suffering gets bad enough, I'm willing to change your mind. I mean to admit I had a problem in certain areas of my life and that my trip has gone so smooth. I think it's because you know, I've grown up, right? And so I'm thinking about all the times when my sister was right and I was wrong. You know, my big sister, my older sister. The times when my brother was right and I was wrong. looking around me, seeing people who are doing things better than I have. And it keeps me in reality. But why do some people, when they've got a problem, say, watching TV or eating too much food or drinking too much or drugging too much, or eating too much pornography or getting too much or under earning, why don't millions and millions of people get help? Why do people choose to stay in suffering? And it's usually unnecessary, right? Just recognize you got a problem. You need to find a better way of doing things. And uh, here we go. Let's see if I can make it down these steps without having to do a very nasty fall. The early Christians, they used to hide out in caves like these, away from the Romans. As a Seventh-day Adventist growing up, how we believed the world was coming to an end. And we'd have to go out and hide for the Day of Judgment. We used to have dreams where, like, what if a family member or a close friend like that to go on the run from the law? And where would I hide them? No, there's no sewage, mate. It's very classy water, it's very high quality. Right? Very low levels of pollution. Australia's into a biodiversity, Sydney's into a biodiversity, doing things in a what, renewable way? What is it? You see much trash, right? I've been walking along here for hours. I don't think I've seen any trash. Where's the trash, mate? Please maintain social distancing, guys. Uh, that may be just rain, so it's been raining a lot. We've had a cyclone on four, so we've had extreme tides and really high waves and thunderstorms. Like the thunder, the water was coming down, the rain was coming so, down so hard. Yesterday in Nambaka Heads, I, I couldn't even look ahead. Like it hurt my eyes. The rain was coming down so hard in Nambaka Heads, which is five and a half hours drive north of Sydney. Okay, we're coming up on Bondi Beach, mate. Look at that. Here comes the rain again. And it's been so great to do this trip emotionally sober. I can still have my, my sponsees lined up. Now a lot of them get the day and time wrong. We'd settle on it time and the day they get confused because we're, we're about uh, we're about 18 hours ahead here in Sydney taking compared to California time. So a lot of my sponsees are missing their appointments. Not very happy about that because I have to like I'm scheduling time in to talk to them and they're not even showing up sometimes multiple days in a row they're not showing up. Just 
it's all too confusing for them that Sydney's on a different, different time zone. And they're asking me for the time difference. Like, why wouldn't people just use Google? Australia, head off Sacred ground. Take off your shoes, you're on sacred ground. So, being emotionally sober means that when other people have a valid criticism of me, oh yeah, I can admit it. I don't have to defend the false self, I don't have to spend a lot of energy constructing a false self. I can just be who I am. And I'm not invested in getting other people to see me in a particular way. So, obviously I've been sleeping in places not my room. So it's not flexibility certainly well, and it's a lot easier to be flexible when you're emotionally sober. Uh, Bondi Beach, mate. Isn't that beautiful? Cute waves out there. So most Jews live within uh, five miles of here. smoking on beaches. There are fewer and fewer places where you can smoke in Australia. I think New Zealand's banning smoking. Sorry mate. Bondi Park. Bondi has become a national icon for its surf history and cosmopolitan culture. Bondi is derived from local Aboriginal languages, meaning tumbling water or water breaking over rocks. I want to acknowledge the original people who lived here. We all do a moment of acknowledgement of the Aboriginals whose land we stole. Any cannabis since I've been in Australia. So they 
do have medical marijuana provisions, but I haven't seen any marijuana shops. I haven't seen any weed shops. Like no you know, wafting odor of cannabis. I haven't encountered that. But you don't get that stink like you do all the time in Los Angeles, San Francisco. Uh, meeting some mates for a walk. Uh, you know, I've been walking for about two hours to get to the spot where I'm going to meet some mates for a walkabout. And then I'll walk about home. It's a nice six hour walkabout. Body surfing beach. Yeah, get me my steps. Oh yeah, people are telling me that I'm telling my sister that I look so much healthier than I did when I arrived. So I think I probably had Omicron before I came here. I had a sore throat for like two weeks before I came here. I tested negative for COVID on the plane. And for my first week. 10 days in Australia, I still had a sore throat. But now it's gone. I remember my first time snorkeling in Clavelli Beach, like how out of breath I would get really quickly. So I think I'm in much better shape. People are telling me I look much healthier. senior high school weight, so am I, about 160 pounds, so 165 pounds, about 5 pounds over my college weight. I was 145 pounds in high school, 160 pounds in college.
back at night. Okay, I think just up the beach I can get away. Yeah, no fire pits on the beach. Let's see any of that. Oh, look at this. Look at all this art, mate. Right? Lots of multiculturalism. Before I go for my big walkabout with my mates. Where's the graffiti? Not a single psychic or tarot reader in sight. No blasting mariachi music. Yeah, well, we're three weeks into summer. So, schools don't start for another couple of weeks. So you don't have one long summer vacation here, unlike the US, where like you get three months off, so that it used to be so that people could work the farm. But uh, here, most people get about a month off for Christmas. And then school kids get about six weeks off. That's about the longest vacation of the year. So the kids train to become Lifeguards, snippers, it's like guard training for the kids. So at Coogee Beach, they'd have like one one main musician to play, or a band.
London, no angry crazy street people. I have a dream. They don't make a mess. Yeah, no trash, no rubbish, no litter. Sydney routinely ranks in like top 10 most livable cities in the world. Low crime, low dysfunction. It's a beautiful Sydney harbour, great public amenities. Like young and old comes to the beach, likes and shooters. Yeah, no abandoned children in darkness. Yeah, some pretty beautiful ways, mate. It's not that bad, then you go open Surf's up, mate. I gotta get in there. What's up, mate?
Okay, mate, so, so here I go. Hey mate, 40 here. So it's January 7th here right now, but it's January 6th in the United States and the news media is engaged in a big orgy of introspection and retrospection about the true meaning of the January 6th riots and our democracies you know, under threat. I mentioned in my earlier video, I don't think the January 6th riots has any threat to our democracy. Okay. I mean, the riots were quelled, and uh, it was dealt with, and the people who participated in the riots and engaged in illegal behavior, by and large, being tracked down, arrested, and charged. So, and it's see any threat to our democracy. But let's, let's reconsider some things about the January 6th riots. So, I was broadcasting after the high point of the riots, so I think I started broadcasting about 1.30 p.m. California time. 
and uh, I think the riots had just peaked. But I remember from the chat, like, everyone was incredibly enthused, it was like, stirred, it was excited, it was fired up. Like, the reaction to my chat was this was wonderful. And I thought it was a wonderful spectacle. It was like an amazing event that I could never have anticipated. But I didn't think it was a good thing. Like I immediately thought, what are going to be the consequences of this? Are we going to have more speech crackdowns? And yes, we have. Like are we going to have less freedom as a result of reactions to these riots? Yes. Going to have less freedom. Our the uh, people who advocate a right-wing response, are they going to face increasing marginalization or uh, increasing stress or increasing government investigation? Like when the government investigates you, you're in trouble. The government has an awful lot of resources. And any one of us, if we poked into our lives deeply enough, we'd find all sorts of things that would look horrible to an outside perspective. So. January 6th riots brought speech crackdown, fundraising crackdowns, tremendous blowback against the right wing and Republicans and Trump supporters. And I'm, I believe I anticipated this January 6th last year when I was broadcasting. I immediately thought this is going to be horrible, right? It's what uh, Tom Sowell calls first stage thinking. You don't think about the implications of what you're doing. Like many people just thinking, first age thinking. So I'm going to do X and there won't be any consequences. But it's childish. Like for every action we do, there's a reaction. And so, for example, Black Lives Matter overall has reduced support for black causes among non black Americans. Right? Antifa. And Antifa acts out and increases support for law and order and for Republicans. So without Black Lives Matter riots and the Antifa riots of 2020, I think Trump would have been defeated much more handily by Joe Biden, but he was able to make it close thanks to reactions, particularly among many non-white voters. Oh, you know, we want law and order. We, we've seen Black Lives Matter and Antifa and we're frightened. What's going on there? So there's the cricket field down the bottom of the street. Some high quality cricket here in Coogee. Feels great to be back in Sydney. The big smoke, big city. So in Australia, we call the outback Whoop Whoop. So I was lost in Whoop Whoop. But there are a whole bunch of movies, I think, Wake and Fright, about getting lost in the outback. And uh, the latest is a miniseries on Stan, co-produced by the BBC, called The Tourist. And I didn't care for it. I, I guess some would argue it was smart, and the TV critics love the show. But there's no one I could root for. Right? I need, I need people to root for. I'm not going to get engaged in a movie or a novel or a film unless there are people I can root for. And so the tourist just left me completely cold. I noticed that with a lot of other critically praised movies. I guess critics, because they see so many movies, they particularly need novelty. But I think for regular people, we want an emotional catharsis. We want to experience something. So I noticed a lot of critically praised movies, TV shows have kind of left me cold. They just don't engage me. They don't involve me. I don't. Uh, I don't root for anyone. Like if I'm watching a sporting event and it doesn't include one of my favorite teams, then I don't feel much emotional connection. No. So it just kind of leaves me cold. Now, January 6 riots. You know, I share some of the the right-wing Trumpist inclinations of the crowd that committed those criminal acts. But my reaction to how law enforcement should respond is identical to if January 6 rioters were Black Lives Matter or Antifa. Right? It doesn't matter to me if the rioters are right-wing or left-wing. But if Black Lives Matter, the trash the United States 
capital. Antifa trashed the United States capital. But, like left wing unions have done it, or American Chamber of Commerce have done it. G'day, mate. Like my, my reaction would be the same. So, what disappointed me was the overwhelmingly positive reaction by the people in my chat to the January 6 riots. They were like thrilled. I immediately thought we're going to have less speech, less freedom, you know, fewer fundraising opportunities. Uh, it's going to be used to tar and feather all Trump supporters. I think this is a disaster. Absolute disaster. And I don't buy Tucker Carlson's conspiracy theorizing that it was really you know, left wing agitators who ginned up the January 6 rioters. That's absurd. It was absurd from the get go. That's Coogee Beach. Coogee, it's an Aboriginal word, means smelly. The beach is regarded as smelly because there's lots of seaweed. But generally speaking, if you get big waves like this in Coogee, then the other beaches are going to be closed. Generally, Coogee has only very placid, gentle waves. When you get big waves in Coogee, then there's a cyclone offshore or something like that, then the other beaches are going to, are going to get closed down. But they can't force you not to swim, they just withdraw lifeguards and strongly, strongly advise you not to swim. So that's an example of the government you know, intervening against you know, the individual's freedom. Where is the sun? Well, this is the middle of summer and it's been raining all morning. But it's a perfectly nice uh, 80 degrees outside, so it's warm. But uh, generally rains more in the summer than in the winter here. So Sydney gets about four times the amount of annual rainfall as Los Angeles. Look at that. This is the Australian Temple. The beach. All right. So. I think one thing that united the January 6 rioters was a sense of victim. Like, victimhood is like absolutely intoxicating. And you know, a moderate amount of victimhood can serve you, right? So obviously, sense of victimhood was too intense that the January 6 rioters drove, drank from. So if they'd had, say, one-tenth of the amount of victimhood, that would have given them a sense of purpose life, it would have bonded them with other people, it would have given them energy, but wouldn't have provided so much high octane fuel, they would have gone out and committed crimes. Great public resources here, look at this lovely drinking fountain, absolutely beautiful. So depending on the situation, like victimhood serves you to varying degrees, if you need a tremendous amount of energy, like high octane fuel, like people who committing the French Revolution or the Russian Revolution of 1917, then you need maximum amounts of victimhood because that's rocket fuel, that's high octane, to energize you and bond you to others and commit you to the cause. But if you have that high octane fuel of victimhood and you're living in the United States of America, which is by and large a law-abiding society uh, that can tip you over the edge. So the Black Lives Matter rioters have a very strong sense of victimhood. And the Antifa rioters had a very strong sense of victimhood. And so if they'd, they'd been able to dial it back to about 10% of what they had, they would, they would have still gotten group cohesion and they still would have gotten energy and purpose, you know, an identity. But they wouldn't have been fueled to commit so many criminal acts. And so, generally speaking, across society, there was enormous backlash to Black Lives Matter. So less support for Black Lives Matter, Black causes after the Black BLM riots than before, among non-Blacks. So in our daily life, more than a, a small amount of victimhood does not serve us, right? So, to fuel an in-group identity, yeah, a small amount of victimhood serves you, like all nationalism depends upon a sense of victimhood. 
So a little bit of victimhood, a little bit of resentment against our groups. That can fuel your in-group identity, your in-group cohesion. Give you a little bit of energy and purpose and kind of clarify life so you know who your friends are and who your enemies are. But once you start turning up, that victimhood dial doesn't really serve you because it distracts you from the things that you can influence, like family, friends, your career, your education, your skills, your pursuit of spiritual peace. Right? Absorbed in daily life in a, an industrialized nation by a high sense of victimhood. So it's all about turning the dial up and down. Like, I love strong in group identity. You know, I love feeling it among my like, fellow Trump supporters or fellow Republicans or my fellow Americans or my fellow Dallas Cowboy supporters or my fellow Australians or fellow Jews. But Identity, absolutely essential. I'll be a tremendous source of my energy and enthusiasm. But as Jonathan Hyde says, identity binds and blinds. It blinds you. So that's why I like doing these streams because it forces me to get outside of my habitual identities and to do a show where I try to understand things from multiple points of view. So yeah, I'm a Dallas Cowboy supporter. Sometimes I want to try to shift to a more objective perspective. Yeah, I'm a Republican voter, but sometimes I want to shift to an objective perspective. Luke, you're going to miss the Australian Open. I'm vaccinated, mate. You can't deny me. I was thinking about going to the uh, third day of the fourth test match. Is it the third test match? That's no, the fourth. So between Australia and England, it's getting played about three miles from here at the Sydney Cricket Ground. But I looked up, I looked up the ticket prices, and like fifty-three dollars is the cheapest ticket. Fifty-three bucks. Okay, I'm not willing to pay fifty-three bucks to watch some Test cricket. Particularly as the day's going to frequently get interrupted by rain. I don't really care as much about tennis. Like I, I cared a bit about tennis when John McEnroe was playing like, and, and Jimmy Connors and Bjorn Borg and Boris Becker. So in the late 70s, the 80s, I cared about tennis. So the personalities were that compelling, but now I don't really care. So I'm on a walk, I think I might go to Bondi. Let's go on a long walk about. died as a result of the Ferguson effect in the summer of George. Like thousands and thousands of Americans died because of the huge increase in murder rates due to Black Lives Matter rioting, which led to police backing off, which led to more opportunities to commit murder. So thousands of people died as a result of the huge increase in murder rate following the Ferguson effect in the summer of George Floyd. And so to me, Black Lives Matter riots and the Antifa riots, the Ferguson effect, all this agitation against cops, cops being racist for the last uh, about seven years. To me, it's a hundred times more serious than the January 6th riots where virtually nobody died, maybe one or two. But I guess that massive discrepancy in life just doesn't matter to, to our uh, media elite. So when you compare the amount of attention given to the January 6 riots to the Black Lives Matter riots. Now I get that uh, rioting in the in the US Capitol is more serious, right? So you had left wing agitators in Wisconsin rioting against Republican Governor Scott Walker and they took over the state capitol. So taking over a federal capitol, yeah, it's more serious than the state capitol. The rioting in any capitol 
No, it's more serious than riding at a Kmart or a Woolworths. So, I don't think the media attention to the January 6th riots is you know, wholly foolish. Now, I don't, so I think it's probably magnified by, I don't know, somewhere between gets 10 to 100 times more attention than I think it deserves. That, that's my view. But I, I enjoy, re I read a lot of reports on January 6th riots and, and uh, looked at some of the documentaries. But uh, yeah, compared to the Black Lives Matter riots, I think, uh, I think it's getting disproportionate attention. Now, I don't think we're living in a police state just because of the reaction to January 6th. Right? In, a, in a more repressive state, the law enforcement would have opened up with machine guns. So, I don't think the, the legal response, by and large, to the January 6th rioters has been disproportionate. From what, now there may be individual cases where it's disproportionate, but overall, I don't feel much sympathy for the January 6th rioters. The law enforcement response seems to make sense to me. But I want that same sort of rigorous response to Black Lives Matter riots that disrupted the lives of tens of millions of Americans. Put millions of Americans in fear for their life and property, damage the livelihoods of thousands of Americans, did billions and billions of dollars worth of damage. And at the same time, this terrorist group, Black Lives Matter, they got subsidized by Fortune 500 companies. They were on the way to Bondi from Kuji. So I'm walking north from Kuji, along Sydney's eastern suburbs. So I think many of uh, LA's problems could be solved with less affordable housing. Because in the eastern suburbs, you know, rental prices and home prices discriminate, so you don't have to. So there's no rent control here in Sydney. And uh, rents just respond to supply and demand. So there was an article in Reason a couple of years ago about how Sydney rents were going down because due to the demand, there'd been a big surge in uh, building apartments. But Los Angeles has extensive you know, rent control, Santa Monica's rent control. And so, all the affordable housing, you have millions of people in Los Angeles in a free market could not afford to live here. And so Los Angeles and California in general are heavily subsidizing dysfunctional behavior. And so your neighborhoods like South Central, right? That is prime real estate. It's next to downtown LA. The weather's beautiful. Your 15, 20 minutes drive from the beach, right? prime real estate, you should we should have a lot of, you know, up and coming people moving there. I'm gonna first get Susan W to put down the hand sandwich. Then she look, damn, Zuma's looking great. So I think many of LA's problems are because we have too much affordable housing. Right? It subsidizes dysfunction. So no rent control that I'm aware of in Sydney. And so, there's no crime around here because pretty much everyone who lives here is an upstanding citizen who works hard. Like Sydney is like the fourth safest city in the world. Right. Australia overall is really safe, but there's so much funding of the dysfunctional in California. And I think making housing affordable is really the big problem. And there's Sheila Mermaids. Oh, mate, those are, those are secrets that uh, I can't tell you over YouTube. So I haven't seen any drunk and disorderly conduct while I've been here. I haven't, I haven't seen any unpleasant interaction since I've been here. The siren's calling to Luke from the waters. Yeah, I think I might walk to Bondi. Great surf at Bondi Beach. Their body surfing there. Yeah, we've had a cyclone offshore for the past week. That's given us just ripper, ripper waves, mate. High tides, really exciting times out in the ocean. 
I was just reflecting this morning that one question I haven't asked is, what does God want me to do? Does God want me to move to Sydney? Or does God want me to move to LA? So I'll admit, I haven't thought about that. And I haven't thought about, you know, where can I be of more service? Like, where can I help more people? Like, that's how my dad would think. He was choosing between LA and Sydney. But I admit, I haven't been thinking in those terms. Need to see your mama, Luke, since Jay found his mama at Santa in Santa Monica. So, remember after the 2020 election, JF was doing all these shows about uh, release the Kraken, what Sydney Powell's release the Kraken and Lynn Wood, and giving all this credulous support and airtime to the uh, voter fraudulent voter fraud case. Man, it didn't stand up very well, did it? Right? So it's about 15 months now from the 2020 elections. The evidence comes in, it's more and more clear the voter fraud did not play a significant role in the 2020 elections. So yeah, JF just seems to seize on things. Like he changed his whole mind on vaccines. He went from indifferent to opposed based on one you know, fraudulent study by a couple of anti-vaxxers. And then I haven't heard from, from people who, who believe that voter fraud played a big role in, in 2020. As the evidence has come in, I haven't noticed anyone changing their minds. And I haven't noticed anyone changing their minds about the January 6th riot either among, among my, my chatters. Like it was obvious that it was a disaster on day one. I think you know, we have fewer freedoms now as a result of January 6th riots. That we have more of a situation where the government is hostile to Americans. That we have more restrictions on fundraising. We have more government investigation of the right wing. That the January 6th riots were an absolute disaster for the Trumpist and right wing cause. Now, on the other hand, the Democrats have endured even bigger disasters. So in the midst of a huge crime wave and even liberals don't like to, you know huge rates of crime uh, Biden hasn't been able to get anything done so I think shortly after it became clear that Biden is going to be elected I, I made the case again panicking like it did not seem to me that Biden was going to be able to get a lot done so I'm much more of a structuralist than most people who pay attention to politics like I think it's the structure that uh, has more to do with how politics works than personalities. So whether Donald Trump or Joe Biden is in office, it only matters mildly, moderately. Look, does it violate the terms of service to use the word that rhymes with Hindu? I'm not sure. Where's the guy with dreadlocks for all the skating while playing guitar? <laughs> so we're, we're for a year into Joe Biden's term, and he hasn't been able to get almost anything done. So, I don't think the Joe Biden presidency has been any great disaster. Because it's the structure of the situation. There's much more than personalities. You know, whether it's uh, Tony Blair or Boris Johnson as Prime Minister of England, it only matters maybe five to 10%. It's like, it's the structure, right? So that's Tom Wolfe's analogy about US politics. It's a train going down the track. Does the lack of social tension make life exciting? Well, what did the lack of social tension makes it really easy to connect with people? Because you don't, you don't have to worry so much about putting a foot wrong because you're not gonna have people like getting all, you know, up, up in your grill, right? So people are friendly. And there's you know, not a sense you have to be constantly on guard. So, social cohesion, social trust. Good times.
Hey, I think you're supposed to go that way, mate. Hey. Come on, mate. You're supposed to go that way. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. How are you? We saw a cat. Oh. Very excited. Oh, of course. It's the first cat encounter. Cat's the best. <laughs> cat's the best. Sid. Next to dogs. Naughty boy. Come on, Sid. Listen to your master. Ah, <laughs> oh, it's just so easy to talk to people here. You just walk down the street and say, G'day, mate, g'day, mate. How are you, mate? No worries, mate. Hey, Dinkum. Radio. That's all right. But on the downside, the news is really boring here. Like, what tops the news is the number of like COVID cases and you know, the number of you know, little changes that the government makes in response to COVID cases. So we've had like nightlife shutting down here in New South Wales. We've got even more restrictions in. Victoria. Oh, we've had a big increase in people wearing masks outside. Oh, and in Queensland, like I was in Ten of Sands, central Queensland, where there almost nobody wore masks. And, uh, and then, because nobody had COVID in Ten of Sands, they tested positive as far as I'm aware. Now dozens of tested positive. So I noticed my brother operates a garden center. Like, mask compliance was like, above 95 percent so Australians are larrikins and they have a brash image I was just watching there's a terrific uh, documentary series on the ashes which is the cricket competition between Australia and England and mentioned that Australians are more brash more risk-taking than the English the English are nicer and more polite so the Australians are more aggressive so they're more willing to risk getting out for the sake of scoring runs but Australians are still incredibly law-abiding, still incredibly law-abiding. So pretty much everyone can go to the garden centre or go to the chemist in Queensland, they're all, they're all pretty much wearing their masks. There's very little opposition. Even the seagulls are friendly here. Even the seagulls aren't afraid. funny if I slipped and fell into the ocean. At least my, at least my iPhone is waterproof. My dad loved the ocean. It was like the only time that he'd sleep well when he gets to swim in the ocean every day. The battering of the waves and just relaxing. I love the smell of the fresh air by the ocean. It's reduced my neshama. No question, quality of life is much higher here. Walking down the street, much more of a pleasant experience. Riding public transport, social amenities. Like you go to public restaurants here, they all have toilet paper. Like reams and reams of toilet paper. Like all sorts of public amenities you couldn't have in Los Angeles because it would, it would just get destroyed. But here you get all sorts of prompts for good behavior. People by and large follow the prompts. I haven't seen any leaf blowers in Sydney. Oh, so everyone does their own yard work. I've noticed in Sydney. All right? People look after their own kids or they send them to childcare, but not many people have nannies. All right? I haven't encountered anyone in Sydney who has a nanny. Now, I'm sure there are some, but I think proportionally much fewer in Los Angeles. People seem to all do their own yard work or they hire white people to cut their grass. Yeah, I, I don't 
don't see any empty beer bottles, liquor bottles. I can run into very few drunks. And people take care of the wildlife, they take care of the social amenities, they don't you know, rip off the toilet paper and public loos. They don't destroy rare wildlife. Like, I was swimming in, in a beach uh, yesterday and I was able to like pet the groper, the blue groper. It's a fish, right? It's a protected fish. And I was just able to swim along with my snorkel and pet it. Right? And so, like much of the plant life, the animal life around here is protected and people abide by it. Right? They're not, they're not wrecking the place. So people are much more willing to invest in public goods if they're not going to be destroyed by angry rampaging youths. So Australians don't tend to be as like outwardly patriotic as Americans, but they're much more cohesive and they're much more willing to pitch in and to you know, sacrifice for the greater good and to look out for their fellow Aussies. Oh yeah, Clavelli. This is this is the beach I was at yesterday. Able to pat the, the blue gropers, like these big fish that swim along. Sometimes bull sharks get in here, but they don't. They don't bite me. Yeah, so this is Clavelli. It's midway between Kuji and Bondi. But like at every beach, there's like a a lifesaver club. Life saving, big part of the culture here. Yeah. Now it's the middle of summer right now, or it's about two or three weeks into summer. But you still get rain, it still gets overcast. Ah, oh, you wouldn't believe the wildlife. You go snorkeling, I mean, you see these most beautiful birds. Whoa, I just received a big donation. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. So, yeah, I, I, uh, I hear from like right-wing Jews, like Jews who are interested in the alt-right, but you know, they don't want to go off the deep end. Uh, so I'm like someone they can talk to. The people who are interested in the wildlife but I don't want to get sucked into it. So that's kind of fun. That's, that's one of the positive externalities from doing this, is you get to meet a lot of interesting people. Like, I don't have the huge audience, I don't have the big audience that I used to have, but I have really good quality people who watch this show. The people who have jobs, people who have graduate degrees, people who are left alone. Snorkeling and seeing birds. Oh, but the birds, mate, just beautiful. I mean, life, youth, man. I just love it. Makes me feel young again. God made me this way. Now, we had Cronulla riots about uh, 15 years ago because there's a bit of a culture clash between Lebanese and the Muslims and uh, regular Australians. So apparently some of the Le Lebanese, the Lebos and the Muslims, they would, they would mock and denigrate the Aussie women who would wear bikinis to the beach. So the Aussie men then rose up. So what, what church is for Americans, the beach is for Australians. People come here with their computers, their iPhones, very happily leave them on the beach, go for a swim, come back, and they're still there. People are so fit. I see very few fat people here on the eastern suburbs. Like it's just a really aesthetically pleasing experience to 
walk along the eastern suburbs of Sydney. Now, in regional Australia, you find a lot more fat people. So in like poorer areas, you find a lot more fat people. But you go into a high rise, not many fat people. Luke, do I think that Ashley Babbitt got what she deserved? Um, I, would, I wouldn't phrase it that way. I would say that her actions precipitated what happened to her. That she acted in a way that brought about that result. Right? So, someone, a police officer pulls a gun on you and you charge that police officer with a gun. Right? You disobey police officers and I'm not surprised if they shoot you. Right, so I'm, uh, I don't, uh, I don't uh, lose sleep about what happened to Ashley Babbitt. She engaged in incredibly self-destructive behavior. January 6th rioters engaged in incredibly socially destructive and self-destructive behavior. So it wouldn't have surprised me if the cops had just opened fire on the crowd. It wouldn't have surprised me if there were hundreds of casualties. Right, you try to riot and overtake Capitol Hill, then I think cops would be within their rights to open fire. And I would say that too for demonstrators who block highways or block other government buildings and the cops have to open fire to protect them. JF rode the super chat way, yeah. So JF and academic age, they, they essentially follow the super chat wave. They say what their audience wants to hear. Would the response to Ashley Babbitt have been different if she were black? Yeah, I think there would have been, I don't know, 5%, 10% less likelihood of getting shot. The statistics show that the police are less likely to shoot blacks than other groups because they know how much of a response they'll get. So yeah, less likely to get shot if you were black. Did you see the Antifa plants that broke those windows before she went in? I'm skeptical of those claims. That there were Antifa plants that were, you know, ginning out the agitation. Like once you make the case that voter fraud determined the 2020 election, then these kind of riots are inevitable. So Trump and his team did pave the way for these riots. This, you know, Donald played significant role in creating the January 6 riots. Because once you make the case that the election was fraudulent, a bogus case, then you're letting people off the hook of moral responsibility because you are you are fueling them with a sense of victimhood, such a strong sense of victimhood that the whole country has been stolen from them, but then there are no moral limits to how people respond. So Trump helped to create a situation where there are no limits to how people would respond. A bunch of lefty articles against the regime, why no action taken. So, so the left has played the, the January 6 riots much more effectively than, than the right, it seems like. But yeah, I, I don't believe it, it, in uh, massive voter fraud in American elections. But I, I recognize that Democrats believe nonsense about the 2016 elections. So by and large, according to polls, Democrats believe the 2016 elections were illegitimate because of Russian interference. Republicans believe the 2020 elections were illegitimate. So I don't think you know, Republicans are any more deluded. It's just kind of a groupthink mentality. So a typical reaction when your team loses is that you blame it on the refs. So, sense of victimhood that Republicans might develop from this that may well give them more power and influence and uh, propel them to victory. So I don't believe in the case for a massive voter fraud, but I recognize it can unite people. So I'm skeptical of the, of the case that uh, January 6 riots were, were primarily engineered and carried out by you know, left-wing anti-Trump agitators. Seems pretty clear to me that uh, 
crowd was pro-Trump and whipped up by Trump. And when you look at the individuals involved, they see generally kind of a tra sad trajectory, such as when you don't have a normal amount of human connection, you develop a desperate need for meaning. So many of the people who participated in the January 6th riots have this desperate need for meaning. So when you have a desperate need for something, you tend to make really bad choices. And so out of their desperation, out of the sense that the country was being stolen from them, they made really bad choices. So there are much more effective things that you can do if you feel like the country is being stolen from you. Because like, the riot only encouraged the opposition discredited the Trumpist cause to people who might otherwise be open to it. So I think it's a really bad idea to disobey police instructions. I think it's a really bad idea to charge police who have drawn weapons pointing at you. And I think it's a really bad idea to add to like the tension levels of police or anyone. So whenever you up the tension levels with anyone, people are much more likely to overreact, right? So to react in ways that you don't anticipate. So yelling at police, threatening police, charging police, I think is a really bad idea whether you're on the right or the left. So I don't believe the left played a significant role in infiltrating the alt-right with regard to Charlottesville. I think the alt-right made its, most of its mistakes on its own. And it's always very tempting when you've got a strong group identity to blame your troubles on outgroups. And I think most of our troubles are within ourselves within our own group. So just like Charlottesville resulted in a huge decrease in social media freedom and ability to fundraise and this destroyed the old right in terms of polite society. And so to the January 6th capital riot damage to the cause. But because of all their democratic mistakes, Republicans probably overcome the own goal that they suffered on January 6th. Take back the House, take back the Senate. It's probably a pretty good position for the 2024 presidential election. Which I think uh, regular people are just tired of the skyrocketing crime. Biden, one of his major election pledges was that you know, he was going to fix COVID, or well, more people have died of COVID under Biden than under Trump. Now, I don't think that's primarily Biden's trouble, but he ran his 2020 campaign in large part on false pretenses that he could control COVID. Obviously, he hasn't been able to. So, he's proven to be a highly ineffective president, much more ineffective than, than Trump, it looks like. Can't get any legislation passed. Okay, now we're moving towards Bondi. So George Soros from Mass up Australia X Well, I don't believe that George Soros has as much power I just as uh, many people on the right claim. I just think he's very effective. So why can't the opposition to George Soros be as effective as George Soros? Like, why can't people on my side of the political spectrum be as effective as people who are my enemies? Because Australia very strictly controls immigration, it's able to keep wages high, social services high, and it's the best country in the world for an average bloke. One of the 
richest countries in the world by capita. And uh, probably one of the top five luckiest countries to be born in. Now the downside, well, there's prosperity, happiness, and goodness, is that the news is very boring here. So we get huge doses of American news. We just don't have enough crime and dysfunction here to uh, keep for an exciting news show. I like the Sydney Morning Herald. I like the Australian in the Melbourne age. So those would be my three favorite Australian newspapers. Was uh, Ashley Babbitt a hero? So Ashley Babbitt was the woman who was shot dead by I think the Secret Service agent on January 6, 2021 during the Capitol Hill riots. And if you think she was a hero, it's just all a matter of your perspective. So if you believe in QAnon, then, uh, then you're very likely to think that she's a hero. If you believe that the 2020 election was stolen, then you're very likely to believe that uh, she was a hero. Right? So if she becomes the, the martyr for some kind of right-wing revolution that makes America and the world a better place, then she was a hero. So, you know, heroism is uh, not usually an objective thing. It's usually highly subjective. So, some of the nutters who set off the American Civil War, in, in retrospect, uh, they may become to be seen as heroes if you think the American Civil War was a good thing because it ended, ended slavery. So. We, we have no idea what will happen. So if the January 6 riot set off some kind of right-wing revolution that ends up improving this country, then uh, the January 6 riots will be, come to be seen as, as a good thing. So right now, I think the January 6 riots were a disaster. I don't think she was a hero. I think she was a silly woman who charged a law enforcement officer who had a gun drawn on her, right? So not a good idea to charge law enforcement officers who have a, a gun drawn on you. So it reminds me a bit of, of COVID, right? You may not be, believe in COVID. You may you know, be tired of COVID restrictions. You may not believe that the world revolves around the sun. You may not believe in the laws of gravity. And uh, you may not believe the law enforcement officer who's got a gun drawn on you and is giving you instructions. You may not believe that that person needs to be obeyed. But uh, if you disregard reality, you're the one who's gonna pay the price. Like reality just is, like we have no idea what's going to happen with COVID. So I notice in many of the comments on my videos, people are very confident that this is the end of COVID. We have no idea. We could very well have a much more lethal strain of COVID sweep the world starting next week. All right. We have no idea if this is the end of COVID. We have no idea if Omicron will provide a substantial protection against uh, future variants of the coronavirus. We, we just don't know. So reality just is, the coronavirus just is, COVID just is. And whatever our emotions are, or whatever our thoughts are, or whatever our opinions are, are really irrelevant compared to the force of, of this disease. So we have no idea what's coming next. We may well need more restrictions going forward, right? Uh, the, the first wave of the Spanish flu was not the most deadly one, right? It was uh, additional waves down the road. Yeah, Ashley Babbitt got, got played by Trump. So she was, she was credulous, all right? She believed in QAnon, right? Someone who believes in QAnon could, can believe in absolutely anything, all right? Can believe in a flat earth, uh, can believe the 2020 elections were stolen. Like if you believe the 2020 elections were stolen, then Ashley Babbitt is gonna be a hero to you. If you believe in QAnon, Ashley Babbitt's gonna be a hero to you. If you believe that you know, Donald Trump is going to save us from satanic pedophiles, then Ashley Babbitt's going to be a hero. Now, I don't believe any of those things, so to me, she was a, a, a silly woman who, who made a big mistake. And you, you, read, you read a little bit about her, and uh, it appears this wasn't her, her first mistake. I mean, she made, she made a lot of mistakes. She, she had a bankruptcy. She... Uh, she had a you know long criminal record, all right. So 
This is a good article from the Associated Press. The first time Celeste Norris laid eyes on Ashley Babbitt. So how did Ashley become Babbitt, right? This is the story. The future insurrectionist had just rammed a vehicle three times with an SUV and was pounding on the window, challenging her to a fight. This is not a normal woman. Right? Ashley Babbitt was not like a normal law-abiding uh, citizen. So Celeste Norris says the blood between them began in 2017 when uh, Babbitt engaged in a months-long extramarital affair with Norris's longtime live-in boyfriend. When she learned of the relationship, Norris called Babbitt's husband and told him that she was cheating on him. So Ashley Babbitt pulls up yelling and screaming, Norris said, about the July 29, 2016 road rage incident in Prince Frederick, Maryland. It took me a good 30 seconds to figure out who she was. Just all sorts of expletives telling me to get out of the car that she was gonna beat my ass. All right, this is not a normal, healthy woman. So Babbitt was large, later charged with numerous misdemeanors. So the attack on Norris is an example of the erratic and often th threatening behavior by Ashley Babbitt, who was shot by a police officer while at the vanguard of the January 6th riot at the US Capitol. So she was an Air Force veteran. She died while wearing a Trump campaign flag wrapped around her shoulders like a cape, All right? So she was a complicated woman. Right? She, she became consumed by pro-Trump uh, conspiracy theories. She posted all these angry screeds on uh, social media. And she had this long history of making violent threats. Right? Someone who's making a lot of violent threats, right? that's, that's not a well woman. Normally not, not a healthy thing to do. So she, she was 35. She was fatally shot while attempting to try, climb through a broken window at the US Capitol. And uh, her husband said, there's never been a person who actually ran across in her daily life that didn't love her. Well, yeah, that's obviously not true. So she, uh, she was a woman who made a lot of terrible decisions. And, uh, and you know, participating in January 6th riot was just one of them. But once you believe the 2020 elections were stolen, then participating in a riot like that makes sense because there are no moral restrictions on you once you believe that... Uh, you know, that American democracy has been, been hijacked. So I think Trump bears some responsibility for the January 6th riots. So on a scale of one to 10, with 10 being a nuclear war and say five being 9-11, like I view the significance of the January 6th riots as about a one, right? I view them as much le less significant than the Black Lives Matter riots and uh, or the Antifa riots and the thousands of extra dead Americans as a result of the Ferguson effect and Black Lives Matter and, uh, and Antifa. But on the other hand, I don't think it was nothing. I don't think it was a false flag operation. And I think the people who participated in it used really bad judgment. So right now I'm hanging out at Coogee Beach and I, uh, I was out Bondi Beach on Friday and I left my, my $70 gimbal behind. Like after I took a swim in Bondi Beach, I realized I was late. So I got out of the ocean, checked my phone. It was 1.40 p.m. And I had a 2 p.m. appointment with a bloke who was about three kilometers away. And so I rushed to take a shower and like I washed the sand off my gimbal and I put it down and I forgot it and left it there. And when I came back about three hours later, it was no longer there. So I left a phone message with the North Bondi uh, Life Saving Club, to see if anyone uh, turned it in but I'm thinking of getting the $400 uh, DGI creator combo. So they have all these external audio options. So I guess the airport's uh, reasonably near here. I think it's 20 minutes away, so the plane's going over. Oh, so for the first time yesterday, I heard sirens, right? I've been in Australia for seven weeks, haven't heard any sirens, right? Not ambulances, not, not police. So yesterday, Around 3 p.m. I heard sirens for the first time. So apparently someone fell off the cliffs by the Coogee Beach. So I made a lot of videos walking by the Coogee Beach. Some man in his 20s either fell off the, the cliffs about, uh, what, uh, 15 meters, uh, about uh, 15 yards, uh, about 40 feet to his death. Uh, someone either fell off the cliffs or jumped off the cliffs. But uh, first time I heard sirens. I heard like three different police sirens and an ambulance siren and uh, he fell about 40 feet to his death went into cardiac arrest and and died so that's the one bit of uh, 
drama and excitement and sirens going off and police being caught into action that I, I've seen while, while I'm in Australia, mate. Okay, so I used to think that uh, Steve Saylor's comment section was like the, you know, the smartest comment section around. But uh, now I'm realizing a lot of people who are drawn to dissident politics are also drawn to like dissident science and dissident uh, understandings of, of history and all sorts of like wacky views. So Steve Saylor made a very reasonable blog post, right, about uh, January 6th, right? That uh, not, you know, not, not the biggest deal ever, right? That, that was his point. But there are about 140 comments on this blog post and uh, only one of them made the argument that the January 6th Capitol Hill riots were a bad idea. Like, I used to think Steve Saylor commenters were, you know, about the smartest people around. But uh, the, they overwhelmingly didn't think that uh, January 6th was such a big deal. Shows me not so smart. She was a fine person. So this is what uh, C. Saylor says. Wake me when January 6th is over. The commemoration of the mostly peaceful protest of January 6th, 2021 is too important for just one day. We need Congress to declare a January 6th history month or maybe a January 6th history quarter that runs through March every year, or perhaps channeling January 6th into any part of the calendar is a threat to our democracy. So we should have ongoing, never-ending, year-round blanket headline coverage like that of Emmett Till, who, in case you missed it, is all over the news 67 years after his tragic death. So we need blanket headline coverage of long-ago hair-touching incidents. So one good thing about being in Australia like very little news coverage about Emmett Till, very little news coverage of anything like Emmett Till. So not constantly being bombarded with, you know, Emmett Till news. So tell me if you can, uh, can see this clearly. Oh no, you're not going to see it clearly. All right, so yeah, Steve Saylor is just making fun of, uh, of all the January 6th hysteria. Right-wing calls to celebrate January 6th anniversary. Just ongoing, you know, ongoing, you know, blanket coverage of uh, January 6th. It's like, you know, the worst thing ever. But then, okay, I thought that was that was a pretty, you know, smart uh, Steve Saylor uh, comment. But then. The comment section is, is crazy. Like Kyle Rittenhouse needs to go after some broadcast licenses. Steve, Steve Saylor moderates his comment section. Why on earth would he allow a comment like that? An insurrection where nobody was armed? Who said that America couldn't innovate? Well, we often make fun of the argument that, you know, an unarmed person was killed by the police. Unarmed people can do a lot of damage. And just because you don't have a gun don't have a knife doesn't mean you can't do a lot of harm and then uh, remember this when the leftists were chasing the politicians in halls yeah in Wisconsin exactly so I would I would feel the exact same way about Ashley Babbitt if she was for Black Lives Matter or Antifa or for, for Trump and QAnon right uh, just uh, you charge a law enforcement officer who's got a gun trained on you and you refuse to obey then yeah you shouldn't be surprised that you get shot it's all part of the plan. It's all part of the plan to cheapen and punish white lives in per perpetuity. No, it's an, it's an understandable reaction to a Capitol Hill riot, right? We haven't had a Capitol Hill riot like that before. It was not an insignificant event. The January 6th riots to me were a top 10 2021 event. Not as big a deal. I would say they were about one tenth, one twentieth as significant as Black Lives Matter or Antifa riots in the, the racial reckoning after George Floyd's death. So all three guys who killed that jogger just got uh, life in prison. Yeah, don't take, uh, don't take law enforcement's job into your hands. Defund the police and prohibit the citizenry from doing anything to stop crime. Sit in your discomfort and watch sullenly kulaks. This is absurd. And this is like, you know, hugely praised comment on Steve Saylor's website. January 6th mattered. It was significant. It's not the most significant thing ever. How about it had moderate significance? And it's not all part of the plan 
to prohibit the citizenry from doing anything to defend themselves. You can still legally own a weapon, buy a gun, you can get training in, in how to appropriately defend yourself, you can join uh, you know, a, a group, a neighborhood watch, Wake me when Steve says a name. Yeah, like Ashley Babbitt, that's the hero that we need to rally around. That's absurd. Like people who want to rally around Ashley Babbitt as a hero are you know, low IQ or just delusional. All right, here's a comment. Person can love the USA of many generations ago, just like an elderly man can revere the memory of a wife who died decades before. The deceased beloved cannot be brought back. The USA now is a neurotic, drug addicted, middle-aged tramp who wants to kill the old man for his insurance money, she has nothing in common with the beloved. No, America is not quite that bad, <laughs> right? In some ways, we're far better off than the 1950s. In other ways, we are far worse off than the 1950s. So, the United States is improving in some ways, getting worse in some ways. Right? It's not all over. The insurrection is brought to us by the same gang that sold us the steel dossier. Yeah, I think insurrection is a dramatic overstatement. It was a riot. It was, it was performance art. And I would want them prosecuted like any other rioters, like the Black Lives Matter rioters and the Antifa rioters. The insurrection is brought to us by the same gang who sold us on the scandemic. Okay, the, the quality of the Steve's comments, say those comment section, is either dramatically declined or I've dramatically changed. Like, people who think that the COVID is a scam, a scandemic, are delusional. We're, we're coming up on nearly a million dead Americans due to COVID. Well, you can say F COVID, all right? But COVID is gonna do its thing. You may say you don't believe in evolution. You don't believe in gravity. You don't believe the earth is round. You don't believe that the earth rotates around the sun, but that's, that's reality. And you can deny reality, but reality will exact its toll. Halsey English got COVID and beat it in one day. Well, good for him. Ashley Babbitt died while exercising her First Amendment rights as a U.S. citizen unarmed. She should not be so quickly forgotten. That's not an accurate description about what happened to Ashley Babbitt. She, she participated in an illegal takeover of Capitol Hill and charged a law enforcement officer who was issuing her instructions and telling her to stay back. And then, I mean, the, the, the quality of the comment section on Steve Saylor's is side has gone way down. The FBI can't track down which one of its informants or agents was behind the January 6th false flag op. It wasn't a, a overwhelmingly a, a left wing or a false flag op. So what's with the you know, that low, I think, here's what I think has happened. People realize that uh, they've been lied to about a lot of things, such as like, I'm walking around the beach and obviously, you know, different groups have different gifts. Like who's more likely to wear a mask? Well, people in Northeast Asia, such as Japan, were wearing masks for influenza like long before COVID, right? Why do we have the cliche about Asian drivers being particularly careful drivers? because generally speaking, Northeast Asians seem to exercise greater care, greater diligence. Uh, they seem to be more cautious in their approach to life. And so obviously different groups have different propensities to wear masks. Different groups have pr different propensities to jaywalk. So I'm looking out at a street here going past the Coogee Beach and who's more likely to jaywalk, men or women? Obviously men are. Like men will step out and run across the street and their wife or girlfriend will stay there you know, until she feels more safe. If Aussies don't feel the government is serving them, can they form a new one? No. But most Aussies do feel like the government is uh, serving them fairly well. So, you know, some groups have much more muscular definition. You know, some groups are much more assertive and aggressive. Like men you know, commit approximately 10 times as many murders as women. Like there's just so much, you know, human biodiversity when, you, when you're in the city. And, and to 
you know, to think that, you know, all peoples just have exactly the same gifts is absurd. So people, people realize that they've been lied to, right? And people realize they've been lied to, that it's like racial discrimination that accounts for why, you know, different groups have different life results, right? So they realize that they've been lied to in certain things. Uh, they realize they've been lied to that the, you know, constitution is you know, going to protect them. And then people overreact. It's like when you grow up as a kid, you think everything, a normal kid, you think everything that your parents do is, is the best. So if you just learn, if you're brought up to say brush your teeth two times a day, you know, then you think people who brush their teeth once a day or three times a day are wrong. If you're brought up that it's okay to eat breakfast cereal at breakfast and dinner, but it's not okay to eat breakfast cereal at lunch, then you're going to think people who eat breakfast cereal at lunch are just, you know, wrong. So normally we grow up and we think everything our family does is right. Then typically we go off to college and we start to think everything our family does is wrong. Right? And so it's like with, with dissidents, they discover all sorts of lies that have been pushed on them by the schools and by the news media and by, by the government and by our elites. And then they assume that everything that the schools and the media and the elites tell them is, is a lie. And it's like you can kind of see this evolution with uh, Godwood. All right. So, you know, he used to accept what he was taught with, with some questions. And then by about 2015, you know, he realized he'd been lied to about all sorts of significant matters. And, and he had been. But then, you know, he then kept going and think, wow, if they, they lied to me about you know, different groups having different gifts, then maybe they're lying to me about a whole bunch of other things. And so people get disillusioned with the lies, then they become distanced, and then they start automatically assume that elites are always lying, that the media is always lying, the politicians are always lying, and it's just not true. You know, then people become flat earthers and QAnon types and uh, think that, you know, Jews are responsible for every bad thing that happens in the world. Or that you know race explains you know almost everything about people and so it's just like going from one extreme to another so yeah we, we were lied to now our parents lied to us about some things like our best friend our spouse lies to us about some things that doesn't mean you re automatically reject your parents or reject your spouse or reject your friends or reject your relatives and everybody lies we just have to use good judgment critical thinking and discernment and so I notice all these people thinking, well, realizing that they'd been lied to by the schools and by the media and by the politicians, they then just take it way too far, you know, and they become QAnon types or flat earthers or, uh, you know, just reaching for conspiracy theories to try to explain the world around them. How do we even know what the unelected staff infection is doing? Asked the chat. So I made notes. You're lucky this live stream is going to be so rich. It's going to be so packed with comments. So what do you think? Is it the Steve Saylor's comment section has changed or I've changed? I think that's probably 50-50. I think I've changed. I've become more skeptical of dissidents. And I think people who become dissidents then, like most people, take things too far. And they start, uh, they start dissenting on things where they have no rational empirical basis for, for dissenting. So. You may be tired of COVID. We have no idea if this is the end of COVID. We have no idea if Omicron will provide us with significant protection going forward with the coronavirus. So just because you're tired of coronavirus restrictions or coronavirus news does not mean that they are unnecessary or that they are wrong. So your COVID fatigue does not mean that COVID is over or that we just have to quote unquote live with it without taking any additional measures. So it's like saying you know, Russia invaded our country or China invaded our country. Now we just have to live with it. Germany invaded our country, now we just have to live with it. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. This is the age of Aquarius, bro. Big cosmic stuff is happening. All right? The deadliest wave of COVID might start next week. All right? Viruses don't only mutate to become less lethal. They can mutate to become more lethal. Eventually, eventually, but we don't know when they will coronavirus will mutate to be less lethal. So reality is, COVID is... Right? It's not changed by your feelings. So you might feel that you're over the demands of your boss or you're over the demands of public health officials with regard to COVID or you're over your spouse's demands or your rabbi's demands. Well, if you want to maintain relations and you know, have a healthy, happy, good life, you need to take into consideration the, the 
the wishes of other people, particularly those who have power over you, right? Your relationship with your boss is the most important relationship you have at work. Right? You may get along better with 50 other people at work, but it's your relationship uh, with your boss that's the most important relationship at work. And so if your boss says something and gives you directions, you, you can't ignore it, but it uh, probably won't go well for you. Oh, I heard a good comment from uh, in a 12-step meeting by a woman. I had to quit Facebook. I'm not a normal Facebook user. It was like a vape pen. I was going on there every 15 minutes. So this is like adrenaline addiction. And I've got, I've suffered from this adrenaline addiction. Love, excitement, chasing adrenaline. And adrenaline highs are really dangerous for addicts. So you may not be a normal coffee user. You may not be a normal YouTube user. You may not be a normal uh, chocolate user. You may not be a normal you know, porn user, you may not be a normal credit card user, right? Some people can't handle Facebook. Some people can't handle YouTube. Some people can't read a book without it, you know, driving them crazy, all right? So, so uh, we have to recognize when, when we can't use something normally. For example, my father would say, would never eat chocolate because for him, it was easier to abstain than to be moderate. Oh, so, I've been uh, staying in an apartment uh, building for the last few days and occasionally, you know, there's loud talk outside, but you never hear people like yelling, shut up, right? That kind of confrontational talk that you hear routinely in, in Los Angeles and other big cities, you know, shut up. You don't hear that so much. I, I don't think I've seen an angry person since I've been here. Oh, everybody waits in line here. So I think in some ways Australia is more egalitarian than America. So. Australia's uh, cricket captain, Alan Border, he'd wait in line for a taxi. So everybody waits in line, usually patiently. Everybody queues up just like the English here. Oh, and uh, another example of Australia's egalitarianism is that you call the Prime Minister by his first name or a nickname. So if, if you were meeting Prime Minister Bob Hawke, it'd be like, G'day Bob, or Scott Morrison at ScoMo, right? So you would not call the American president by his first name. So. Uh, Americans have, I think, more respect for, for the presidency and for politicians and for people in power. And Australians are more, Australians are more cheeky, more disrespectful, more egalitarian. They yeah, call the prime minister by his first name. Like even Australia's cricket captain has to wait in line, right? Doesn't get special. Doesn't get special privileges. Oh, so I'm watching, watching a sports doco on KO Sports. KO Sports is great. It's got a million subscribers here in Australia. Basically, all your live sports and sport documentary needs, like the ESPN 30 for 30, they're all on KO Sports. And it's, uh, it's, it's like only $26 a month, and like all your live sports streaming needs are met. So I was watching KO Sports, a, a cricket documentary, and, and like it had this like tagline on its cricket documentary, End Violence Against Women. Like, why not end violence against men? Why not end violence against Jews? Why not end violence against Muslims? Like, end violence against children? Like, why on earth would you have, like, a tagline, end violence against women, in, in a cricket documentary? Like, you know, this Black Lives Matter stuff, this, you know, end violence against women, uh, it just rubs me the wrong way. Like, this special pleading, it, it just, uh, goes against my Anglo heritage. So Kenneth Brown is doing this series, Liars on the Right, and it's really bad. Like the, the ones on Edward Dutton and Richard Spencer, he, he, does, he does nothing to establish his case that these people are liars. So Richard Spencer is definitely a flawed human being, but uh, he's, not a, he's not a big liar. He's about as honest and transparent as you could expect a public figure to be. So uh, Kenneth Brown is, becoming really good at uh, doing provocative titles for his streams, but the content frequently just does not live up to it. So his series Liars on the Right, uh, particularly the two episodes that I caught on Edward Dutton and Richard Spencer are really weak. Yeah, he does do a Richard Spe he does do an excellent Richard Spencer impression. He does a lot of uh, good impressions. He is very smart. And he sometimes has uh, really sharp things to say. But there's just so much nonsense that uh, it's often, you know, too tiring to try to, 
if I had to sort through the, the nonsense. Oh, so if I you know disagree strenuously with someone, I don't necessarily bring it up, like with my friends. Like a lot of people I know are anti-vaccine or anti the COVID vaccine. I just don't bring it up with them. So I'm surprised by how many people I know are anti the COVID vaccine, but I just don't bring it up. So I believe in the traditional conception of marriage is between one man and one woman. But, you know, if I've got an acquaintance who thinks differently, I just don't bring it up. Uh, so, you know, I think adultery is a bad idea, but if I've got a friend who's an adulterer, you know, I don't bring it up. So I notice that on the one hand, there are people who think that if they believe something strongly, they've always got to bring it up with their friend who disagrees or acts differently. And I think that's a mistake. You, if you've got friends, you should just, you know, drop topics that are not a useful basis for conversation. And then on the other hand, people who are afraid to stand up for anything because they don't want to alienate their friends. And so they keep quiet about what they believe. So you don't have to bring it up to the people that you disagree with. But how about a middle ground? Like, I want to get along with my friends, so I generally speaking don't bang on about topics that uh, we can't have a you know, pleasant conversation about. On the other hand, I don't abstain from saying what I think on YouTube or on my blog. Now, I still believe in the traditional conception of marriage. I still believe in COVID vaccines. But if I've got a friend who thinks differently, like Elliot Blatt, all right, Elliot Blatt and I, we disagree about all sorts of things. And we have private conversations. We have public conversations. I don't bang on about the, you know, the topics where we passionately disagree because there's just, there's no point. I don't send him links. It's like, oh, Elliot, you need to see this link which shows that you're wrong about X, Y, Z. Now, I, I do that with virtually nobody. It's just, yeah, it's just not good etiquette. So, welcome to beautiful Kuji. I'm going for a swim, mate. <laughs>